reach beyond the darkness, beyond the grave, to an unexplored dimension as we travel to the mysterious realm of ghosts. Journey with us into the world of ghost stories. Welcome to our show, I'm Patrick McNee. Tonight we have some extraordinary stories. We'll investigate actual accounts of ghostly encounters. I'm not the kind of person that believes in this weird stuff. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. I thought everybody saw spirit and auras until later in life I was told not everybody sees. Julia died in 1921. Soon after this, her mother began to have a series of unexplained dreams when Julia began pleading and begging with her mother to dig up and exhume the grave. Although the field of parapsychology in America is only 100 years old, the Native Americans have been aware of the spirit world for thousands of years. This story is about just such a spirit. The Navajos believed there were many spirit forces at work in this world. One was the Shinde, spirits of departed persons, which take on various forms on Earth, often human. Even today, the Navajo spirits are very real to anyone from any culture who encounters Arizona's ghostly maiden, Red Feather. The Grand Canyon in the Northwest the Salt River Canyon in the south. Arizona is a land of canyons. One sandstone walled canyon was found by the Navajo and called the Spirit Canyon. Its walls were adorned with magic drawings by ancient peoples. Today, this sacred canyon is known to only a few, and they know it as the home of the ghost, Red Feather. As told by the Navajo, her story begins about 150 years ago when John Martin, a white trader from Prescott, accepted a young Navajo girl as payment for gunpowder and whiskey. John Martin built her a house which still stands today, although in ruins. It was quite a unique dwelling, incorporating both white man style and the Navajo eight-sided Hogan shape. In 1870, John Smith's bride bore him a healthy baby daughter, Anna. The mother died in childbirth. Anna grew to be a young beauty, with her mother's dark hair highlighted by her father's red. But she preferred to wear Navajo clothes and be called Red Feather. She was not accepted in the white man's world, and she hated her abusive father. So she ran away from home and made her way to her mother's Navajo village. Little did she know, she would also be an outcast in the Indian world. From the day she arrived, forced to work and eat alone, the only place she felt at peace was in the Spirit Canyon. She studied her ancestors' drawings on the wall. One in particular she read as depicting a young man who endeavored to join the spirit world by leaping into the sacred canyon and taking his life. Unfortunately, this became the inspiration for Red Feather to leave the world she was born into, but never fit into. And in 1887, she too ended her life in the canyon. Not long afterwards, local Navajos began seeing a strange vision of a young maiden in and around the canyon. The apparition looked very much like Red Feather. It was understood that she had indeed become one of the Chindi. Of course, the story of Red Feather could easily be discounted as nothing more than pure Indian legend, if it were not for the many corroborating dates and facts, and the modern day sightings. When I was a little girl, I used to go out to Spirit Canyon, which is a sacred place for the Indian people. One morning, I went out there just after sunrise. I saw a woman standing on the edge she was wearing the traditional clothes. She looked like you could see right through her. I couldn't see her face because it looked like it was all black. Then she was gone just like that, and I couldn't believe it. 
I was really scared. And after that, I never went out there again. We like to hike a lot, my husband and I. We take a tent and a little food and camp out for a couple days. We were out in the painted desert. We found this great canyon with petroglyphs on the walls. We decided to camp right there. We had a pretty good fire going. I felt kind of funny all of a sudden. I looked up and there was this thing, this woman or girl. She was kind of glowing. Her face I couldn't see. It, it was glowing all white. I've never seen anything like it. Then she just faded away, vanished. It scared the daylights out of us. We were on vacation with the grandchildren. We like to take the back roads a lot. We really feel that you see much more that way, especially with the kids. We'd been to the National Monument north of Window Rock, and we were on 191 headed back down to the Petrified Forest. I saw a very strange girl walking on the side of the road, dressed in Indian clothes. I'm not sure what it was, but something made me stop. And I looked at her, and she just vanished. I, I'm not the kind of person that believes in this weird stuff. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. She just disappeared. Well, on your next trip to Arizona, if you see a pretty young Navajo girl along the way, looking a bit out of place, I would suggest that you don't stop and chat. We flashed our lights like the legend says to, and we've seen the light come up down the road. traveled to a small farm in Indiana to investigate this next story. It seems that some spirit apparitions can be summoned by a flick of a light. Hundreds of people have come to this farm site to see this ghostly sight for themselves. Rensselaer, Indiana, a small farming community just 80 miles south of Chicago, known for its vast landscape and humble tranquility. It is also the site of one of the greatest unexplained mysteries of the century. Legend has it that Farmer Moody was chasing after his son's abductor in the darkness, guided solely by the light of his lantern from his tractor. After a gallant chase, the man escaped, leaving Moody's dead son behind. Out of despair, Moody hung himself. And he happened to hang himself right here on this particular tree. It's now a tree stump. Three flicks of your car lights is said to summon the spirit of Moody and his bright lantern light. Witness Bob Lemire recalls his own experience. And I've seen the light myself coming out here. I've seen it. We've came out here, and we flashed our lights like the legend says to, and we've seen the light come up down the road, get bright, and then seem to taper off as we went down the road. Lemire's startling home video footage documents his sightings. As he and his friend John approached the stump, they flicked their lights three times. Witnesses claim the light can even appear at will as it did here. The two lights on the right are known objects, while the one on the left appears much closer. After a few minutes, they notice something strange. The light vanishes. A few moments later, it reappears much brighter. After hearing Lemire's story, we decided to investigate. The first step was to call Moody with our car lights. So go ahead, flick it three times. Now let's look in the distance to see if anything happens. Unfortunately, nothing was seen after several minutes. We tried again. Then it happened. A light from the cornfield appeared in the darkness. You can see it in the upper left-hand corner of your screen as our cameraman tried to zero in on it. We have circled it for easier identification. The light appears to be in the sky, but I assure you this is ground level. As you saw, we went from total blackness to the sudden appearance of this strange light. It was time to get a closer view of our findings. What we've got here that could be one logical explanation is this particular stop sign right here. This thing here gave sort of a, a reddish glow from about a mile and a quarter down. 
These other signs at the end of the road could have reflected light as well, but I was wondering where the source of a known light could have been. There was nothing out here. I mean, this is, this is absolutely endless. There, there's absolutely nothing out here whatsoever besides this. Upon returning to the tree stump, we were amazed at the amount of spectators gathered to see Moody's light. Among them was another witness with an even closer encounter. This gentleman, Doug, over here just told me a story that he was here last night. What did you see last night? Um, right up by the side of the road, there was a little body with a lantern just walking around, looking on the side of the road. You could see the whole outline of the body it was bright yellow, and so was the lantern. Whatever skeptics may say, we were there and we saw this light appear from an origin not one of us could trace. The glow of Moody's light will continue to be one of our greatest mysteries. I thought everybody saw spirit and auras until later in life. I was told not everybody sees. For our next story, we went to the source, a group of spirit hunters who not only study spirit entities, but can detect them around you, your home, or your property. Let's hear what the experts have to say. Hollywood has given us our fair share of demons, exorcisms, and hauntings. In real life, however, there are stories that make these movies seem pale in comparison. Harry Shepard is a de-haunter, or as he likes to call it, a spirit investigator. His everyday life deals with ghosts and spirits. Well, since I was five years old, I've been able to see them. I thought everybody saw spirit and auras until later in life. I was told, Harry, what you and I see, not everybody sees. To me, it, it's a natural thing. It's natural. An inborn instinct to fear anything we cannot explain has made us suspicious of any strange phenomena, especially ghosts. To accept the unknown, to accept something that you can't see, is quite difficult in this culture. All of our culture and all of our social life, we're taught if we can't eat it, kill it, or destroy it, it isn't so. Harry is of the opinion that ghosts are merely spirits that have not accepted the fact that they had to leave the earthly plane. He also believes ghosts roam most houses or buildings. We just don't know about them because they are quiet. Only when they become active do people sense this, like doors banging, TVs clanking on and off, changing channels. Uh, then they think, oh, my guard is going to come out of the wall and get me. There's reassurance in the fact that most spirits are harmless and have no intention to make life difficult for people. In fact, they are often around us for our own well-being. Well, the spirit is perfectly content on the other side, but he feels he has to stay to nurture and to comfort the one on the living side. When sudden inexplicable things occur in houses, Harry and a team of experts are normally called to investigate. The investigation is a team effort. We usually use a team of people of between four and eight. And each one of these has a different specialty. Some can see, some can hear some consents. Everybody in the team is essential to gather any information on the strange phenomena. Some people can sense the presence of spirit, but not see it. Some people can see it and not sense it. I can walk into a residence and see if there is anybody there or if there isn't anybody there. They can appear any way that they want to. They can appear as the last they did in their physical life, or they can appear as a cloud. It's up to the spirit, individual. It is more than curiosity that moves people to call Harry to investigate any spirit presence in their house. We tell them what they, who is there, and why they're there. Most of the time, they are there, but they behave themselves, the spirits, that is. Even with the knowledge that spirits are around us and present in our houses, it is only when these spirits become troublesome that a haunting becomes necessary. The process to remove these spirits is far easier than we believe. Well, we ask it to leave. Simple as that. Would you mind leaving? We, uh, there, there is no ceremony, there is no ritual. 
that we go through, we simply ask it to leave. And why would a spirit stay where he wasn't wanted anyhow? One of the most notorious cases of spirit investigation is the John John case in Los Angeles. Strange things occurred in and around the house. The only thing left to do was to call a team of spirit investigators. Something completely unexpected happened. It started out where they were taking Polaroid pictures, and by accident, one of them asked a question. And when the Polaroid picture was developed, there was an answer there. The phenomena of ghosts leave us with little proof, and sometimes just the idea that it was all a hallucination. The only physical proof is what they give us, like the pictures with the writing on them. What's the chance that you would get that exact answer with that exact picture at that exact time? Impossible. Over the years, Harry has built up a collection of voice recordings, those of spirits. At the time of the recording, the investigators wouldn't hear the voices, but when the tape is played back on the recorder, the ghost's voices are distinct and definite in their answers. There was a child's grave, and sitting on top of this grave was the spirit form of a, of a child. When we, when we put, the, put the tape decks down to him, and he, he pulled it almost out of our hand, and we get this little whisper, I'm scared. <laughs> The critics have found every possible excuse to disprove the existence of spirits. They can always find skeptics to, to criticize everything in life, even death. You would think that Harry's job is horrifying, but in fact he enjoys it. He sees it as his mission in life to prove to people that there is nothing to be frightened about. We do this work for nothing as a public service. The more proof we can gather, the better we feel we can, we can serve the public. We do leave them with an idea that, hey, maybe there is something more to life than life. Harry views the spirit world as a natural part of our lives. He believes that it is the physical part of existence that is merely temporary. We have all lived many lives, and we'll all live many more. And the reason that we're here is to learn certain lessons, certain goals that we cannot learn on a non-physical reality, such as the spirit dimension. Ghosts and apparitions have given rise to legends and have created their own place in history. Maybe we can learn to accept ghosts as part of our everyday lives. After all, if we think about it, what are ghosts but the mere shadows of their former selves? I felt this incredible energy come over me, and it was this Chinese entity, Li Sung. In this story, we'll see that spirit entities do not always exist separate from a living being. In fact, many spirits house themselves within a body to serve as a vehicle for communication, a phenomena called channeling. Each of us has the ability to reach a higher power, but we don't even realize it. From ancient times until today, many kinds of people have channeled, but they are known by different names, medium, healer, witch doctor, fortune teller, guru, and prophet. In the San Francisco Bay Area, Professor John Klimo co-directs the doctoral parapsychology program at Rosebridge Graduate School, one of only four universities in the world dedicated to the study of anomalous phenomena. He is also co-founder of OPUS, the Organization for Paranormal Understanding and Support that helps people who have unusual personal experiences. He is considered an expert in channeling. What is channeling? I define channeling as receiving energy or information or guidance from some source other than oneself and originating from some level of reality other than the physical as we currently understand it. I, I guess my roots, uh, not only uh, uh, with regard to channeling, but to most paranormal or inexplicable fields in general, all of which I, I'm fascinated by and see as interconnected, began uh, for me as an artist and a poet. Way back in my teenage years, or even earlier, when I was doing paintings and creative writing and poetry, 
I would feel myself moving into these altered states of consciousness. I'd feel myself getting more and more inspired. And the more inspired I got, the more I, I, I felt, I wondered, where is this coming from? This isn't just me anymore. When I would kind of get in the saddle of the inspired moment, I was connected to other wavelengths, other worlds. Alan Vaughn is a psychic researcher or professional intuitive. He uses his talents in psychic archaeology to discover ancient ruins and in research experiments on psychic phenomenon. But he also has the ability to channel an entity from another time. I went to a number of mediums uh, to see what they could say about me. Three of them said that I would be doing channeling myself one day and gave me the name of this Chinese entity, Li Sung. Well, my response was over my dead body. I felt this incredible energy come over me. And it was Li Sung. There's what I would call full trance or unconscious channeling, where the channel goes away or goes unconscious and then comes back after the experience has occurred and doesn't have recall. I channel in a trance. It's like listening to a distant radio, as uh, Jane Roberts once said. I experience it very similarly. Uh, but Lee Sung shows me pictures of everything uh, he's talking about. And then he uh, impresses me, he's like he's standing behind me, and he impresses me so that it all comes out in English. What I call in my book open channeling, it's the kind of thing that I do. I don't lose consciousness, I don't stop being myself, and as far as I'm aware, there is not a particular identifiable entity that's, that's talking to me, that's working through me. Uh, so far as I know, it's still me, but it's more than me. I don't so much identify with present-day channels that have some entity, you know. I don't cast aspersions on that when it's authentic at all. Um, uh, good uh, day, my... Uh, friends. Oh, we are most pleased to be in your lights. I do feel I connect to the universal. Well, we lived um, about uh, 1,200 years ago by your time in a small village in northern China. The more I get carried away, the more I open up into this, the more I feel like I am an individuation of God in human form, letting more and more of that awakeness and realization pour through me. And as it pours through me, the language picks up faster and faster. I'm grabbing at, 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 at hunks of sentences and metaphors and images popping to me. I, I'm sort of like clairvoyantly seeing all these images. Uh, we uh, counseled uh, persons who had, well, both physical and emotional problems. Uh, and we prescribed uh, herbs and we did some therapy with them. But that there's something larger, a presence pushing to come through this person. And that, that presence is not just that person. To help people understand their past lives, their soul's purpose, how they may enrich their living with spiritual principles in everyday life. We individual human beings have been kept down so long by government, by authorities, by churches, by science, and told, you're only this, you're only this, you're only this. The bottom line of all channeling for me is no, no. We are, we are capable of channeling, of accessing the universal. There can be danger in whom you connect to in the channeling process, and there can be danger in your own psychological strengths. Many people have the will to believe. I have the will to believe. Skeptics have the will to disbelieve. And in, and in parapsychology, there's two camps, the sheeps and the goats. The goats are those that don't believe. The sheep are those that tend to believe. For me, the ultimate channeling is to channel God, the universal creator, creation, being, mother, father, as Lazarus says, God, goddess, all that is. I think we're capable of connecting with all that is. As you incorporate more of the higher teachings into your understanding, then you're also able to teach others. So there must be spreading across the planet this consciousness of spirituality, of hope, and of creating miracles. Heaven is within us, and we are, we are potentially all channels in that we are all able to connect to universal heart and mind, 
and wisdom and energy and, and, um, and be representatives of our creator. Julia died in 1921. Soon after this, her mother began to have a series of unexplained dreams when Julia began pleading and begging with her mother to dig up and exhume the grave. Chicago is the setting for our next story. With its colorful history, there is more to be found on the dark Chicago streets than booming nightlife. And many of Chicago's residents have felt the eerie presence of something more than meets the eye. Today we're going to take a look at a different side of Chicago, its sordid history, that which is filled with cemeteries, murders, and ghosts. People claim to see and feel ghosts. But ghost hunters are becoming much more scientific about the spirit world. And president of the Ghost Research Society, Dale Kaczmarek, shows us how. These devices will pick up that disturbance, and then we can try other equipment like our cameras and tape recorders and so forth. Basically, what this does is it picks up static electricity discharges in a given location. Another DOS meter, which doesn't give an audible signal, but actually gives LED lights. Uh, we have a Geiger counter out here. One photo taken by Dale at Bachelors Grove Cemetery shows this translucent apparition of a woman sitting on a tombstone. We're here today to find out why so many people around the Chicagoland area travel to this particular cemetery in search of ghosts. If you look at the historical uh, significance of the area around here and the, the plots that they had, uh, their names are on all the plots. The Fultons, the Wheelers, they all came from the, the old country, from Germany. So I assume that many of these people that are buried in here knew one another, and perhaps they're still calling their friends even after death. There have been reports within the cemetery, uh, down this main trail, as you walk into the cemetery, uh, what appears to be a woman, sometimes dressed in a white gown or a wedding gown or a bridal gown of some kind, holding a baby in her arms. So we know that through historical records, it belongs to D.W. Rogers. There was one recording which I had heard a number of years ago. Somebody had recorded uh, not too far, a few, uh, five or 10 feet away from this main gate here, uh, a sound of uh, uh, somebody calling Minna, Minna, uh, sort of wailing in the wind. And there is a gravesite in here uh, with that name, that first name of Minna. The dead don't rest too easily out here at Bachelors Grove because of all the, uh, the sacrifice and the uh, things that have went on here in the past. It acts as like a battery, charging up this area to a point that eventually it discharges in a way through manifestations, through spirits, through cold spots, feelings, sightings, uh, and balls of light that people have seen. Bachelors Grove isn't the only haunted place in the city. Next, we went to Chicago's south side to hear the tale of a murder and a ghost. This is the roadway uh, located directly in front of the Willowbrook Ballroom, where in 1931, Resurrection Mary, or a girl named Mary, who was later dubbed Resurrection Mary, was hitchhiking back home along this roadway when she was struck and killed by a hit-and-run automobile somewhere between the Willowbrook Ballroom and Resurrection Cemetery. And since 1931, she has been seen still trying to hitchhike back home from the Willowbrook to the cemetery and beyond, but she never gets beyond the cemetery. We're at uh, Resurrection Cemetery in South Suburban Justice, 7600 Archer Avenue. We're coming up to the main gates of the cemetery. We're in August of 1976, a man traveling by the cemetery saw what appeared to be a girl locked in the cemetery after hours. When the police were dispatched to the area, they found these two bars of the cemetery gates pulled apart and bent at a very funny angle. Impressed in the bars were the impressions of fingerprints, skin texture, and scorch marks. No one was able to give an explanation how those marks were made on the bars. Then we visited the Mount Carmel Cemetery to see the evidence of yet another haunting. 
We're coming up to a very interesting grave here in uh, the cemetery. It's called Julia Bacola Petta. Julia died in 1921 at the age of 29 of uh, complications from childbirth. And she was buried here with her stillborn infant in this grave here at Mount Carmel Cemetery. Uh, soon after this, her mother, Philomena Bacola, began to have a series of unexplained dreams when Julia began pleading and begging with her mother to dig up and exhume the grave. And this went on for many years as the frantic mother tried to get permission from the local parish, the cemetery, and other police authorities to exhume the grave. They found Julia uh, lying as fresh as the day she was buried, uh, apparently uh, no decomposition of the body whatsoever. Uh, there are two porcelain photographs on the uh, um, the monument now. Uh, the top one shows Julia on her wedding day holding a bouquet of roses. The bottom picture on the base of the monument shows Julia as she was found six years later after being dug up in a perfect state of preservation. There isn't a reason why Julia had no signs of decomposition after six years. This day a white ghostly figure is seen roaming near her grave. Now we go to a restaurant in downtown Chicago where the Ghost Research Society found unmistakable photographic evidence of ghosts. Uh, the first photograph shows absolutely nothing at all. Uh, the bottom photograph, taken a few seconds later after the film was uh, wound and recocked, shows some strange light formation to the left of the uh, the bust. What appears in this photograph, if you look to the extreme left near that table, it appears to be a, a semi-transparent figure of a monk-like individual, apparently cowled in a monk's habit. You can see the semi-transparent image above the table and directly below the table, underneath the tablecloth, you can see what appears to be semi-transparent feet and legs. This videotape was recorded by the Ghost Research Society at the stakeout of the restaurant. Listen closely. Personal accounts, recordings, and photographs. What do you think? Are the ghosts of Chicago real? Or unreal. After death, most souls move on to find their final resting place. But what causes some spirits to uproot and continue to linger on this earth? Let's say you think you might have some ghostly spirits living at your home with you. Well, if you find out your feelings were right and your fears confirmed, chances are you'd like to know what to do next. Well, so would we. Thus, our next story. Famous haunts have long been a fascination for the ghost hunter. The Queen Mary, the Tower of London, Abraham Lincoln in the White House, and in recent years, the Amityville Horror. After death, most souls move on to find their final resting place. But what causes some spirits to uproot and continue to linger on this earth? I think that there are a lot of spirits that hover around us and hover around the earth. A lot of them are lost. They're earthbound. They can't figure out how to go ahead and go on in their existence. Last year, a team of psychic investigators were called to a Los Angeles home, reported to be experiencing some rather strange phenomenon. The residents believed they were not alone. Was something lingering within these walls? They can appear any way that they want to. They can appear as the last they did in their physical life, or they can appear as a cloud. It's up to the spirit, individual. We tell them what they who is there and why they're there. There's been a murder in this um, building somewhere. Someone was murdered here, a woman was murdered here. Did you guys check out that front bathroom? I picked up a heart attack in there and I couldn't breathe. This place, this 
is an interesting place. The thought form that it was created here is of a, of a angry fights, arguments, and etc. And it will affect you. It will affect anybody who's in this room. There is a female spirit. There's a sense of a female being here. And you can see them standing there. Or if you're watching TV and you see the movement out of your eye, you That's turn. Strange. And it isn't there, but it is. While some spirits remain locked in their tragedies, there are others who linger on for protection. I keep picking up a older man, uh, bald-headed, and he has gray around his head. I feel he's lived here for a while, quite a while. The investigator describes an entity that she believes is the grandfather of one of the residents. He's with the piece of furniture, and I feel myself that he is, uh, is an overlooking his granddaughter at this time. The occupants have since moved out, but is it possible the spirits followed him? Well, each investigator has their own unique method of finding out. What I look for basically is electricity. Then I know I've got something of a spiritual type of energy force. I use clairsentience, clairaudio, Sometimes they look at an object, get a sense of what was connected with that object. My particular specialty is sensing changes in energy density. Especially if it's a mirror that leads to an outside wall, it could be a portal from which spirits come and go. I saw them when I walked through the door. I saw them. As I walk in the door, turn on, the, on uh, my natural clairvoyancy and see who's there. The lady who was in the other condo, now she didn't, she didn't come. I think she no. stayed with the other apartment. But one spirit was not to be missed, something all too familiar to the team and those who live at the residence. Did you guys pick up on the grandfather this time? Yeah. Uh, yeah, Judy saw him in the little girl's room. Well, your grandfather, uh, he likes the desk. If these spirit entities are all around us, could there be a way to communicate with them? This is one of the pieces of equipment that we usually use to record spirit voices on. At this time, we'd like to ask uh, members of our group to ask a question and to pause about 30 seconds between questions. Each member of the group directed a question to a spirit. We heard no immediate response, but when playing the tape back, we came across something that was literally out of this world. I want to ask the grandfather if he wants to have the desk moved out of the bedroom because he wants to see here in the living room and be around other people. If that's true to say yes and rap twice. Right there, hear it? Right before. Just because we don't see anything doesn't always mean there's nothing there. The bond between life and death raises new questions. Who are these spirits? And in which realm do they really exist? Sold at most toy stores, the Ouija board might look like a harmless game. But some believe it can have serious implications. Those who have used it as a channel to contact spirits believe in its abilities but many claim there is danger in allowing spirits with evil intentions to enter. While answers to your questions can be a simple yes or no, there are times when names and dates are spelled out. Maybe it's mind over matter. Maybe it's not. I'd like to say I don't believe in ghosts. I'd like to, but I really can't. Among the glitter and glamour of Hollywood lies another dimension, the unexplained mysteries of death, violence and tragedy which live in the haunted depths of Hollywood. From Hollywood studios to stars' homes, even the dead cannot resist being in the limelight. Internationally known artist Charles Bragg lives in a home 
with a uniquely star-studded legacy. This is an old house, and uh, it was originally built by uh, William Randolph Hearst for uh, Marion Davies' favorite director, Robert Vignola. And uh, from what we understand, uh, he would rehearse her up here. There's a little theater downstairs with a presidium and uh, curtains, and it's like a tiny theater. And she would come up here and rehearse with the, uh, Vignola. And then twice a week, William Randolph Hearst would come up here and she would put on little shows for him. I'd like to say I don't believe in ghosts. I'd like to, but I really can't. It seems to me that for so many years and so many uh, experiences by so many different people, uh, that it's not beyond the realm of possibility that there is something going on in this world, and in the Hollywood Hills in particular. Well, this is my studio, and uh, it's a very important room to me. And uh, I've worked here for a couple of months before I realized that uh, this is also where Marion Davies put on her little shows for William Randolph Hearst. And I thought it'd be a good idea to just hang curtains on it, you know, just to add a little atmosphere to an artist's studio. And it seems that that's when uh, things started to happen in this, on this platform, uh, after the curtains went up. Suddenly our dogs started to respond. Right around 8.15 in the evening, uh, they would be sound asleep, just relaxed by the fireplace. And uh, all of a sudden they would jump up, get very alert, and then both of them simultaneously make their way down this little passageway, sort of almost a secret little passageway down. And I just find them down there just sitting in the dark, looking straight towards the stage. After uh, watching the dogs uh, behave the way they were, uh, I didn't think too much of it. But naturally, uh, the second or third time, uh, I started thinking about it. So the next morning, I would come down and check to see if everything's in the right place, things are in order. And uh, it's the strangest thing. The curtains were down as if they'd almost been drawn at the end of a performance. They weren't completely together, but it was almost as if the performance were over for that, uh, for that time. And so I put them back up and tried to paint and forget about it, but I can't. It seems that the spirit world is no longer a world apart. I'm Patrick McNee, and that's our show. Thanks for joining me on Ghost Stories. One sandstone-walled canyon was found by the Navajo and called the Spirit Canyon. Its walls were adorned with magic drawings by ancient peoples. Today, this sacred canyon is known to only a few, and they know it as the home of the ghost, Red Feather. As told by the Navajo, her story begins about 150 years ago, when John Martin, a white trader from Prescott, accepted a young Navajo girl as payment for gunpowder and whiskey. John Martin built her a house which still stands today, although in ruins. It was quite a unique dwelling, incorporating both white man style 
and the Navajo eight-sided Hogan shape. In 1870, John Smith's bride bore him a healthy baby daughter, Anna. The mother died in childbirth. Anna grew to be a young beauty, with her mother's dark hair highlighted by her father's red on the canyon. The apparition looked very much like Red Feather. It was understood that she had indeed become one of the Chindi. Of course, the story of Red Feather could easily be discounted as nothing more than pure Indian legend, if it were not for the many corroborating dates and facts and the modern day sightings. When I was a little girl, I used to go out to Spirit Canyon which is a sacred place for the Indian people. One morning, I went out there just after sunrise. I saw a woman standing on the edge. She was wearing the traditional clothes. She looked like you could see right through her. I couldn't see her face because it looked like it was all black. Then she was gone just like that, and I couldn't believe it. I was really scared. And after that, reach beyond the darkness, beyond the grave, to an unexplored dimension as we travel to the mysterious realm of ghosts. Journey with us into the world of ghost stories. Welcome to our show, I'm Patrick McNee. Tonight we have some extraordinary stories. We'll investigate actual accounts of ghostly encounters. I'm not the kind of person that believes in this weird stuff. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. I thought everybody saw spirit and auras until later in life. She preferred to wear Navajo clothes and be called Red Feather. She was not accepted in the white man's world and she hated her abusive father. So she ran away from home and made her way to her mother's Navajo village. Little did she know, she would also be an outcast in the Indian world. From the day she arrived, forced to work and eat alone. The only place she felt at peace was in the Spirit Canyon. She studied her ancestors' drawings on the wall. One in particular she read as depicting a young man who endeavored to join the spirit world by leaping into the sacred canyon and taking his life. Unfortunately, this became the inspiration for Red Feather to leave the world she was born into but never fit into. And in 1887, she too ended her life in the canyon. Not long afterwards, local Navajos began seeing a strange vision of a young maiden in and around. I was told not everybody sees. Julia died in 1921. Soon after this, her mother began to have a series of unexplained dreams when Julia began pleading and begging with her mother to dig up and exhume the grave. Although the field of parapsychology in America is only a hundred years old, the Native Americans have been aware of the spirit world for thousands of years. This story is about just such a spirit. The Navajos believed there were many spirit forces at work in this world. One was the Shinde, spirits of departed persons, which take on various forms on Earth, often human. Even today, the Navajo spirits are very real to anyone from any culture who encounters Arizona's ghostly maiden, Red Feather. The Grand Canyon in the Northwest, the Salt River Canyon in the South, Arizona is a land of canyon. 